Good afternoon. My name is Maurice Mutembeni from the Gordon Institute of Business Science. I'm joined by my colleague this afternoon, Marius Ostes, and senior lecturer at Gibbs. Marius, we are meeting today to talk about something really important, food security. Um, and I can't imagine a time in my lifetime when this topic of food security has been so important, so vivid, and uh, has really captured the imagination of everybody in the world. Suppose the only other time I can think of is when uh, in the 80s, when uh, Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, and a whole host of other musicians saying, we are the world, trying to make a contribution to the famine and the suffering in Ethiopia. But now we're not concerned about we are the world for one country, we are concerned about we are the world for every country in the world. So we can enter this discussion about food security, poverty, and the role of land from a, a wide variety of places. But I thought what might be useful would be to tap into the way we do things here at Gibbs and maybe start with a small case study. I'd like to hand over to you to kick us off with some visual case study, an image or two, and then we can use those images to kickstart the conversation about how food insecurity is affecting many of our compatriots here in South Africa, especially given the work that you've been doing in this space over the last few weeks. Maris Oosthuizen, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ndumbeni. It's great to be with you, Morris, and hi to all the participants um, in our Gibbs uh, stakeholder ecosystem. Um, so yes, you know, over the last few weeks, as we've gone into lockdown, uh, food security has become a national issue. It's been debated. There's been talk about food parcels being handed out by government, by civil society, NGOs. And this came as somewhat of a surprise to many who thought that South Africa is a middle-income country. Uh, we've got social grants, we've got a social safety net, we've got an advanced economy. So, you know, why are people literally starving in a country like South Africa? And to think about that for a moment, I'll go to a case of a, a real experience that we've had here over the last month or so. Um, I took this little video clip uh, driving my car down my street. Now, if you look at the wall and the electric fence there, you can see this is a, a typical South African suburb. But what we started to see during lockdown was... Uh, people coming out of their homes and lining streets, uh, sometimes mothers with babies on their backs, uh, quite literally coming to look for food, right? So this is the kind of thing you would expect to see in a place like India, uh, in Indonesia, where there are hundreds of thousands of poor people. But the reality, of course, in South Africa is that not far from where we live, we find communities such as the one here. This is a community called Moiplas. Uh, the, the locals call the area Sprite. You know, where thousands of people live in uh, really difficult conditions, really resource uh, constrained, uh, most of them working in the informal sector, the informal part of the economy. You know, in, in a lockdown environment, unless they're able to go out and earn a day wage or, uh, you know, a wage that can carry them for three or four days, they really are on the poverty line. And so what we found in this community is that to the surprise, not just of ourselves, but even of, of local government officials, there are 25,000 people, an estimated 9,800 dwellings. And, you know, this is four and a half uh, kilometers from where I stay. This is a community that 20 years ago didn't exist. So it's a democratic South Africa uh, settlement where people are quite literally on the bread line to the point that they will break the lockdown regulations to come and look for food. Uh, subsequently, we've done some analysis and found that there are, are 16 such informal settlements just in Gauteng. And of course, what happened in this particular case is uh, citizens from all walks of life started to react. They started to bring food, bread, uh, all kinds of relief to help this community. We saw uh, NGOs in the local community come together with the police, with the, the Department of Social Development to create food parcels. You know, this is an example of some of the, the NGOs involved. And what we found, and this was again surprising, um, this, this video that I'm about to show you went on Sky News, on Reuters, was a queue of about four kilometers of people came out, left their homes, risked themselves in terms of social distancing to come and access something as simple as a 10 kg bag of milli meal. And so what this lockdown has done is it's brought to the surface the socioeconomic conditions that many, many South Africans 
And in this case, many non-South Africans, these are migrants, many of them from Zimbabwe, Malawi, places as far as Mali, the conditions in which they live, and it, it, need, it, uh, it requires of us then a conversation in response to say, what's the role of the economy and the role of land in particular in addressing this issue of food insecurity? And let me pause there, Morris, and we can unpack and discuss some of what we've looked at. So these are uh, amazing images that you're sharing with us, Marius, and uh, I'm going to ask you to just share some of the work that you're doing in this space before we go into the broader, more philosophical discussions. And then I also want to invite the people that are online watching uh, to post your comments on the Q&A uh, so that we can also engage with you. Uh, we welcome discussions on this very important matter. Uh, Marius, as you know, we, we seconded you to in the national interest to go and work in this space. Would you like to share with, with, uh, with us, please, what work have you been involved with? Who have you been work with, involved with? And what kind of impact are you starting to see out there on the ground? Thank you, Morris. Well, one of the amazing things about South Africa is the resilience in the informal institutions uh, in the country. And so in the wake of the, the COVID pandemic and the lockdown, we saw hundreds of South Africans, business leaders, civic leaders, emerge and start to work on the problem. And so we saw the formation of what's called the Business for South Africa structure, which is led by business leaders. We also saw the formation of what's called the South African Council of Churches, JOC, or Joint Operations Center. And I was very fortunate to be asked to be involved in some of these structures. And then, as you mentioned, Gibbs seconding me to do that work. And what we've been involved in there is bringing South Africans together, whether it's, it's factories and business owners to talk about the production of sanitizer, uh, or, or local production of PPE or ventilators to provide for the South African needs, or whether it's churches and NGOs, mosques and others, bringing their communities together uh, at the local level into what we've called LEANs. So LEANs are local ecumenical action networks that have come together. There's over a thousand of them now in South Africa that are, are really just made up of South Africans who have the means uh, to respond to the need of their neighbors. And so in, in Cape Town and the Western Cape, we saw uh, over 300 of what they call CANs, these are community action networks, pop up in the first month of the pandemic and mobilize quite literally tons and tons of food, sanitizer, uh, hygiene, uh, PPE. I had uh, our colleague uh, Nick Benedel bring uh, uh, literally a bucky load of swatches. These are pieces of material that are used as samples and uh, then had me members in the community uh, because of an initiative driven by my wife uh, teach community members, uh, women, how to make masks in the early stages of the pandemic. And so we've really seen uh, just a range of uh, social innovations by formal and informal institutions reacting to this problem. Uh, I was fortunate in that, in that process to help to think about the strategy of that and the structure of that and how we mobilize resources at the national, provincial and local levels to meet the demand for some of these things. Yeah, so it would not be a business school program if we didn't come up with new four-letter or three-letter terms like leans and cans. So thank you for that. It makes me feel comfortable that I'm in the right place. Um, so I'm going to try and take this discussion in two places. I will start in the place that we are more comfortable with. It's in the economic space and then move into another place that maybe business schools are less comfortable in, that's in the space of land. So let's start in the comfortable space of the economics. So we know, for example, that 40% um, of our GDP is uh, driven by the formal economy, uh, by the large corporations, and, and then and the other 40% is informed by the small and medium-sized enterprises and a lot of informal economies. However, when when we are thinking about South Africa, very few of us actually understand that informal e economy. And, and I'm sure very few of us could even imagine that there were lines of four kilometers long for people to go and collect a 10 kg milli meal, for example. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm just thinking it really would be helpful to, for you to give us a, a more of an insight into that world more of an insight into that world of uh, the informal, the, the masses, the, the, the small businesses, what they are going through in this period. And, and hopefully that can help us to understand what role we can play, those of us in the formal economy, to be more inclusive, to be more engaging of the informal economy. Because 
these economies are codependent. One can't exist without the other, and, and we can't dislocate. We have to relocate and connect together. So please give us that insight again of what is actually happening in the small, medium-sized enterprises in those informal economies. What have you seen in the time when you've been out there? Well, Morris, that's a great question. You know, as, as uh, people from Gibbs and people in our ecosystem that work in corporations, uh, we typically move through spaces where we're surrounded by robust, often world-class corporations, strong formal institutions. But for many millions of South Africans, that's just not their day-to-day -day reality. You know, if you think about the fact that 12 million South Africans a day estimate uh, use the taxi uh, system. Now, many of those come into our operations, work in the mail room, work in the cleaning division, work in support services, but many millions of them are going about their business looking for an opportunity on a daily basis to use some kind of practical skill to add value to their community. You know, we talk in the business school about a value chain, but if you climb out of a taxi at a taxi rank and you see a gogo with two buckets and a plank, and on the plank are some chips and chewing gum and uh, maybe a comb and, you know, other trinkets that she's selling, what is she doing? She's really bringing goods and services to the last mile in the informal economy. Now, our laws and rules are set up to accommodate registered businesses that pay tax, that pay IF, that pay a skill development levy. But underneath that formal economy sits an enormous informal economy that does everything from hairdressing to cooking uh, hot meals to delivering goods and services. And it's quite incredible when you see the efficiency of that economy. You know, you go to a place like Moiplas, and we took a drive through the one day, a group of us to understand the environment. And we found six different uh, male Malawian seamsters. These are guys that sit there with a sewing machine that make a living by fixing the length of your pants or the shape of your jacket. Uh, and next to them would be a hairdresser. Next to them would be a fresh grocer. And what's quite incredible is one or two of those would have a speed point, right? So they would be able to take a payment from a debit card, which is in the, inf in the formal economy attached to a formal bank, but they would be selling goods and services hand to mouth on a daily basis. Now in an environment such as the one we've, we've come through with the lockdown, what we did through that lockdown is to freeze the formal economy and by implication, withdraw billions of rands in circulation from that informal economy. And what this means very practically is the mother of three that used to feed her kids by going out and cleaning a house washing a floor, sweeping something, you know, using her capacity to work in some kind of way, she was constrained from doing that. And if you think that you and I could live on our credit card for 90 days or six months, depending on, on how we spend, an individual like that literally only has a day or two worth of income that she has to roll over and survive on. And so what this has exposed is South Africa's structural vulnerability. And I'll finish with this. You know, we have 18 million people today on social grants in South Africa, but then there's a number of, of 11 million of working age who are unemployed. The implication of that is that there's a growing bulge of young dependent South Africans and non-South Africans that don't have access to the formal economy. They don't have formal jobs and pay tax uh, at the end of the month, but they do need to make a livelihood. And so as businesses, we can play a role by opening our value chains and our procurement structures and the way we think about our, our business boundaries to create ladders of inclusion for those South Africans and non-South Africans. So it's quite a challenge what you're raising for business because a lot of businesses themselves right now have to think about surviving before they even think about this new thing called um, uh, it being more inclusive. Um, so, um, whilst you're thinking about how business can survive on the one hand and be more inclusive, let me just lean into some of the chats that are uh, happening here and just share some of the comments. Uh, uh, Gwen Foster says, an aspect that is ignored is the change in requirements for smallholder and community producers. Uh, here she's talking about food safety legislation, food safety records. Uh, these things are not being addressed. Most new farmers fail because of the technical data barrier to trade. Do you have any views on that? Absolutely. You know, Morris, when it comes to uh, the value chain of agriculture in South Africa and food production and food processing, we have to appreciate that we somehow have to accommodate a very efficient, uh, large-scale production uh, in the formal part of our food value chain. So we've got 
large scale commercial farmers, we've got highly efficient retailers, wholesalers that distribute food. But at the same time, we have to find a way to accommodate these small scale emerging farmers. Now, the way to do that is to create the mechanisms that what we call the aggregating mechanisms like fresh produce markets that are able to aggregate the supply from those small scale farmers and put them in touch with the market in a way that they can sell their goods and services. There's a great example of this being done by ZC, uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, the, the name escapes me, but the largest fresh produce producer in South Africa, ZZ2, that's the one I'm looking for. They the actually have a project where they, correct, where they work with, with uh, people on the ground and they say, bring us your small scale production, we'll aggregate it alongside our large scale production and then we'll go to market together and we need more of those. Lovely. So, and then at the same time, Ian Williamson says, how do we see the role of community saving schemes such as Stockfeld's evolving in the near future? Adding this, adding to this, how could e-commerce impact on these groups and be Im impacted by these groups? You know, this is a, a very important question. Uh, it goes to the question of access to capital. You know, we typically, when we talk in the business school about access to capital, we're thinking of a big bank lending a business owner or business leader with a business prospectus, you know, a business loan. But in these kinds of communities, what we're looking for are short-term micro-financing opportunities that are able to give people the capital to buy the inputs or make the transport uh, or procure the, you know, the, the, the means of production for their small-scale operation. And with the technology we have these days, with digital platforms, with SMS payments, we're able to create those platforms and the vehicles through which communities can obtain capital, but also share that capital amongst themselves. In this particular project that I'm involved in, uh, we've been able to use e-vouchers, for instance, to send people the cash voucher of 50 rand, 100 rand, 200 rand. And today the technology exists to do it, I think what we need is the entrepreneurs with the vision to say, how do we take that and go to the spaces where traditional forms of access to capital, such as stock fells, exist, and how do we innovate to, to scale those and make them more effective? Lovely. So, Marius, um, for quite some time, land has been a, an issue in this country. The, the, the subject of land is quite emotional. Um, and and gets people, it can be very divisive depending on how you handle it. And as you know, in, in our country, our government has been involved in uh, ch changing legislation um, to allow uh, a, a change in land redistribution. So I just wanna keep it unemotional for the moment. Um, from what you've seen, without getting into the politics of land in South Africa, from what you've seen in the recent past, in the COVID times, what do you think the impact of our current land ownership structures and land policies has been on um, the, the topic we're discussing today, the topic of food security or food insecurity? So Morris, I think let me start with the micro and then go to the macro. You know, at the micro level, uh, I traveled with one of the journalists who was interested in this uh, event or this, this crisis happening around food security. We went into this particular settlement and we found a woman there surrounded by a, a group of young people as well as very small children. And uh, she told the journalist that she's from Zimbabwe and she'd come to South Africa with her two children and that she's thinking of going back to Zim. And uh, the journalist said, well, why would you go back? You know, things are worse in Zim at the moment from a food security point of view. And she said, well, at least if I go to Zim, I can plant. And we said to her, well, why don't you plant something here? And she said, well, because I don't own this land and because the community see me as a migrant, they don't let me plant because it's not my land and they won't let me plant either. Now, at the micro level, what does that mean? It means that a person with the skills, the know-how and the interest to deal with their micro food insecurity by being productively engaged with land, that person is being prevented from doing that, not only because of ownership patterns, but also because of the license that we have in South Africa, the informal permission we either give or don't give each other about this issue of land. If we go to the macro picture, less than 5% of Gauteng residents uh, eat food that they have produced. Now, what does that mean? It means that more than 95% of people living in our province rely on the retail chains to access food. What that means is that there's a fundamental 
insecurity between food security and economic well-being. The moment that our economy goes through a crisis, 95% of residents in Gauteng will be, have a food security. Now, in resolving that, of course, the question of land, uh, not only land ownership, but land use comes into, into being. And we have to discuss, well, what does that mean and what are our choices going forward? And I think one of the big mistakes is that the land debate is only being held in relation to land for me. So I want land for personal reasons, for cultural reasons, for identity reasons. But there's a different question we have to answer as South Africa, which is what is the role of land for us as a nation, right? Land remains a fundamental enabler of an agricultural system, of a food system. And to do that effectively, land has to be used very productively and in, in, in our day and age, very efficiently. And it's for this reason that what we've seen in the last 30 years in South Africa has been a consolidation of the agricultural sector. We now have less than a third of the commercial farmers we had in 1994. And the reason for that is it's very difficult to make money in agriculture because of the competitiveness around pricing, because of the vulnerability around climate and, and weather. And so somewhere between our personal uh, passion around land and land access and land ownership, and our collective responsibility for food security as a nation, we have to find a balance where we say, how do we redistribute land, expropriate land, whatever we need to do in a way that protects the country's stability, but also address the various needs and interests of our various communities? Yeah, land is a very difficult issue. Um, and I think we, we, we can theorize from our, the comforts of our homes, we can theorize from the comforts of our businesses, but ultimately uh, it's, it's a, it's a multi-layered problem. It's a historical problem. It's a personal problem. It's a current problem. It's a, it's a community problem and it's a country problem. And I suppose what I'm interested to, to, to hear your views on is what are some of the ideas that people are using? So if you think of ZZ2, for example, what are some of the ideas that people are deploying at the moment to, to make the best of the current land parcels that they have uh, to, to facilitate uh, food security in our country? Yeah, so there's a, a range of, of solutions and approaches, you know, from uh, on the one end, uh, government initiatives where government is looking and thinking about a state-led intervention uh, where government tries to expropriate land or redistribute land and then fund and enable communities to use that effectively. But we're also seeing very interesting innovations in the private sector. You know, we've got mines taking land that's unused, that's under their ownership and care, that might have a mine uh, taking place underneath it and making that land available in places like um, the, the Northwest to local communities who want to use that land productively. And then all the way through to uh, individual farmers that take 25, 20% of their land and give that to, for the use of their farm workers. I know there's a very successful case in the Cape, for instance, where farm workers in the last five years have gone from multi-generational workers to being co-owners of a new brand of wine that is produced by the traditional, the, the, the farmer alongside the, the more traditional owners of the land in the long-term historical context of our country. And so I think that what will happen in South Africa is probably a range of different solutions. You know, if we as South Africans involved in this sit back and wait for, for government to come with a solution or for business to come, uh, it probably won't happen for various reasons. It's too politically complicated. There are too many uh, complexities at the local level. What is probably more likely to succeed is if a generation of South Africans come to the fore that can balance the various interests of the country. They can say, what's the difference between the long-term interest versus the short-term interest? What's the difference between my personal interest, which we have a right to pursue, versus my community's interest? And what would be the right kind of model for land use and distribution, for food production, for other uses, mining, et cetera, that's going to meet those interests in the best possible way? And so in some ways, I think we probably need a social compact around land that doesn't see land as a contentious issue over which we should fight, but sees land as a platform on which we can come together to create a future that we all want. Great. So I want to go to some of the chats, some interesting conversations from Heather and Valerie. But before I go there, let me pick up on something that Pakam Mambikwa 
um, I think it is Mbikwana, Pagama Mbikwana has raised. Uh, uh, the, the point is, I think the point about the Zimbabwean migrant having land back home and therefore having the security and backstop solution to plant at home versus South Africa's South Africans who are landless and resourcefulness. Small parcels uh, for South African nationals are imperative for economic growth and food security at family level. I think you would agree with that, Maurice, and uh, that's the same point that you were making just now in terms of the role of land to facilitate food security. So, yes. Morris, I'm actually one more slide here it, that tags onto that comment. Um, I'm busy in a, in a project at the moment with uh, Dr. Yaki Salia and the ISS, working with some international partners, looking at the impact of COVID in Africa. And one of the things we found, and this is a preliminary forecast of some scenarios coming out of the pandemic, is that the additional mortality in Africa that we are likely to see as a consequence of uh, COVID and the economic impacts, in the best case scenario, we are going to see an additional 200,000 people having died in Africa by 2030. In a worst case scenario, at the bottom here, additional mortality in Africa over and above the pandemic is about 400,000 people. Now, why do I, I put that up in relation to the question about land uh, access and land use? Because the availability of land in and of itself isn't the solution to poverty and insecurity. Those additional deaths of about a half a million people are because of low levels of nutrition, low levels of early child nutrition in particular, and general poverty, which then compounds hunger with things like disease, etc. We have to appreciate in this day and age that land access has to go hand in hand with skills development and the understanding of the economics or the business model, if you look at it at the micro level, of how do you turn land into a productive asset? You know, very controversially in South Africa, when the, the whites expropriated land in history, they turned that expropriated land into a productive economic asset. And they did that, of course, in ways that violated the human rights of the other people living in this part of the world. The question we have to answer is, if we gave South Africans thousands of small holdings, small land parcels, how do we take the excellence that exists in South Africa around land use and productivity, and how do we make that part of the deal? How do we transform the way we think about land from uh, something you own and that sits there waiting for you to decide what to do with it to a real productive asset that can be leveraged for your benefit? And, and in Africa, we see many countries that have access to land, sometimes very uh, arable land, but unable to turn that into large scale productivity. And so in South Africa, we have to solve all those problems simultaneously if we're going to see us raise people out of that poverty into more uh, higher, higher levels of quality of life. Okay, so that leads me to the next point, And this is where I'm gonna uh, refer to Heather's comment, the point around resources being both of a financial resource, capital, so to speak, technical resources, um, in terms of knowledge and skills, and then that know-how, the ability to transform this land with the technical and capital and human resources into something productive. So one of the policies that has um, really been a, a political rod, so to speak, uh, during this lockdown period is the use of B legislation and B requirements as one of the requirements you have to overcome to access support from government schemes and so forth. So Heather says B, B, B legislation has already had a bad rap in South Africa. Do you think that using this legislation, especially around enterprise development, uh, is being done effectively by corporate South Africa through the CSI initiatives? Surely this represents an opportunity to transition subsistence to formal businesses. What do you think about using existing uh, transformation legislation, if I can use that term, as a mechanism to get the corporates to partner with the communities um, and obviously to leverage government policies to move people along the, the, the ladder from subsistence to formal uh, um, agricultural concerns. So I think, Morris, the debate about BEE and the implementation of BEE has been locked into 
quite a simplistic debate, which is typically, is BEE good or is BEE bad? I personally think that's completely the wrong debate. Um, the, the fact of the matter is South Africa's economic structure and the ownership of the economic structure is skewed around racial lines, number one. And number two, we have to find means and mechanisms to change the structure of that. Now, we can call it BEE, we can call it empowerment, we can call it uh, collaboration, we can call it public-private partnerships. At the end of the day, we have to find ways of bringing more South Africans into the productive side of the economy. And to do that in something uh, like the land debate around agriculture, for instance, we have to answer more difficult questions, such as what is the business model of the future that is going to make this investment viable? So, you know, saying that we want land and we want government to fund uh, equipment, those two things on their own is probably not going to create the outcomes that we desire. What we have to do is say, what is a business model around land ownership, around the productive use of land, and where's the market that this business model is going to service? So who are we going to export this produce to that we're going to produce? And then we have to ask ourselves, what is the role of the various role players in doing that? Now, it might be the case, if I be very stereotypical, that you have an old white farmer with skills and you have a young emerging farmer with no experience. Those two individuals can complement each other incredibly if they recognize the contribution that they have to make respectively. Similarly, the government has to ask the question, what is it that government brings to the table that the private sector can't bring to the table? And in many instances, the early stage capital to invest in new ventures is not going to come from the private sector until there's a proven business case, but can come from the public sector. And similarly, there might be a stage where it's the best thing if government pulls out of a project to allow the private sector and the interests of citizens to take that over. I think in my mind, to, to finish this point, the debate around BEE has to move away from a debate about race and become a debate about empowerment, saying, what does empowerment mean? You know, and if I be very controversial here for a minute, a, a 60 year old white male farmer who's never worked in a partnership with a black South African needs to be empowered to work with these fellow South Africans. And so empowerment is a broad concept that means we develop the capacity as South Africans to work together in productive ways. And I think that's where the focus should be. The model at the end of the day is less important. So we're about to wrap up and, um, and I'm gonna to refer to a comment by yet another one of our Gibbs MBA alumni. Thanks Valerie, thanks Heather. Um, for example, there are others of course, and forgive me if I'm not recognizing you. Um, and Marius, clearly what we have seen um, in, since the 18th of March or so the 28th of March, whenever it was, so I've been in lockdown with my family since the 18th of March. I think the rest of you guys have been in lockdown since the 20 something of March, uh, 28th of March or thereabout, is that um, there's been a lot of social capital between business, between government and between civil society. And this social capital has helped us to put together uh, social mechanisms of support, some of which you showed us in your pictures earlier. Others are being offered by the banks, by the Department of Labor and Employment, by different departments and so forth in, in government, and many businesses, uh, some wealthy families and so forth. And it really would be a, a serious pity if we try to go back to where things were as opposed to leverage uh, this newfound social capital to, to, to go and redefine our society. And as somebody said to me yesterday, we can't go back to yesterday. We can't go back to where things were because the way things were was really problematic. Now I'm seeing Valerie, for example, saying, does Gibbs have any initiatives going on right now that we as alumni could plug into in terms of contributing or assisting. She says her cohort, meaning her classmates, um, are, are very keen to do something as a collective. Now, of course, we will reach out to her separately <laughs> and her cohort, and so we welcome these kinds of calls. The question I'd like to ask you is just broadly in the country, uh, what are the much larger scale initiatives that people could tap into to make a contribution, whether it's a contribution of their time, 
their skills, their network, their financial capital, and so forth, to reach out and, and, and address this uh, problem of food security in its immediate requirement, but also over time on a sustainable basis. Well, thank you, Boris. I think that you know, there might be two, uh, two points to make in response to that. The first is that capital on its own won't create wealth, whether it's social capital, whether it's intellectual capital or financial capital. And I think what we are going to have to do in the next months, in the next few years in South Africa is think about how do we invest that capital? How do we mobilize that capital in productive ways? You are right that in the lockdown period, there's been this flurry of social capital in the country uh, rem reminiscent of 1994, reminiscent of the World Cup, reminiscent of, of these moments of positivity that we've seen in the country. But what we're going to have to do, and, and I think the president is probably going to come out guns blazing along these lines in the coming weeks, is we're going to have to take that social capital with our intellectual capital and our financial capital and point it at the crises and the problems we have in the country, whether it's a lack of education, whether it's a lack of employment, and of course, whether it's an, an issue of food security. Now, you know, when people say, where do I get involved? It re often reminds me of a conversation I had with Jay Naidu in the first year that I was at Gibbs. Jay was addressing a forum and I came down uh, with a friend of mine down to the front of the stage at the end of the session. And I went up to him and I said, this is my mate over here. Uh, we want to get involved. Um, talk, tell us which leaders we should go to, uh, to talk to about getting involved. And he looked at us with a shocked face as only Jay Naidu can do. And he said to us, what do you mean, which leaders? You're the leaders. And it sort of was jarring at the time. But I think the lesson out of that was very often we're looking for someone else to give us the recipe to solve the problems in our immediate community. Um, I'll share one more slide here in, in 10 seconds. Uh, what we've done in the community that I'm involved in is we've developed a, a group of people from across races, tra traditions, uh, different parts of the community. And we've developed a, st a strategy for this community that looks at, and we've, we've called it the Straight Food Security Forum, that looks at solving the immediate need, which we've done through food parcels and uh, you know, tons and tons of food has been delivered in that way. We're then collecting data from the community that enables us to collect uh, from those community members uh, who they are, how many children do they have, how many dependents, so that we can support them in various ways. But ultimately, what we have to do is develop projects that speak to the actual needs of the community we're, we're dealing with. It might be an informal school on a Saturday morning for the kids of one community or a vegetable uh, tunnel in a different community. And I'm going to make it more difficult for our participants and say, I'm not going to give you the answer to that question. You need to give us the answer to that question. That's what leadership uh, is all about. And I guess that's what, what Gibbs tries to catalyze uh, in the work that we do. Marius, thank you very much. As always, very good to talk to you. And I hope that uh, our delegates and viewers have enjoyed our conversation and look forward to learning more about your good work. I see there's somebody who's raised their hand. Let's have a look as to who that is that has raised their hand. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'll have to go and have a quick look on the attendees. I can't pick you up. Somebody, you put down your hand, so I cannot. Jeffrey Wolf and Lebu, because so the problem is you can't speak Jeffrey Wolf and Lebu. What you need to do is to put your comments on the on the chats and let we will ask Marius to respond. Do so quickly. I will uh, chew some cud with him in the meantime while I wait for your comments to come through. Um, and uh, so Marius, um, you're a futurist, and as a futurist, I wonder if you could offer us a few scenarios, not, you're not a Sangoma, so please don't make any promises. <laughs> a, a few scenarios of, based on the data and the analysis and uh, your various conversations with other futurists out there, what kind of futures are we likely to be emerging into uh, one year from now, two years from now, three years from now? So thank you, Morris. And uh, this is really a, a part of the work that we're doing at the moment, looking at Africa, but of course, South Africa is part of that story. I think there are fundamentally three alternative futures that emerge. The first is what we're calling a V-shaped recovery. Uh, and that's a future where the crisis goes away quickly enough for things to normalize or get back to where they were. 
it's very likely in that future that South Africa will be caught in a low growth debt trap. You know, we've got very high debt levels, we've got very low economic growth. And the question that that poses for us as South Africans is do we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and turn a V-shaped recovery into a boom where we get the economy growing above 3%. That's one scenario. I think we have the capacity to do that. But the second scenario, slightly more concerning, is what I've called the U-shaped recovery, where on the back of the pandemic, we go into a number of months, maybe two years of slow, stagnant growth, uh, where our debt levels rise, where we start looking a lot more like uh, Argentina. We run the risk of a debt default. And this, unfortunately, is an environment where some South Africans begin to vote with their feet. They begin to look at uh, where's the passport, especially the skilled South Africans. And the risk that that creates for the country is that we lose the core center that has the capability to take the country into a, a long-term future. There is a worst case scenario, which I've called the L-shaped recovery, where Africa and South Africa, because of the impact of the pandemic, really take a fundamental, what we would call a structural hit where in economic terms, in trade terms, in investment terms, we lose a decade of economic growth. Now, that is possible. But what's interesting about South Africa is in many ways, we're a lot like Singapore, South Korea, uh, and other emerging economies before their big transformation. The question is, what are South Africans going to do to shape the future? Are we going to sit back and be an environment taker where everything that's happened around the world and here happens to us? Or are we going to assert ourselves in the next two, three, five years, especially young South Africans, 35-year-old, 40-year-old, are we going to assert ourselves and put our fingerprints on the next decade and say, let this be the decade that we build the South Africa we want? I think if we chose that option, we have a tremendous amount of agency to shape a much more visionary and exciting future. But that's really going to depend on the type of people that we work with at Gibbs. So I can see uh, you, you, you went back into your time in the US. Spelling is not a strong point for the Americans. So you gave us the LUV uh, scenarios. Um, and hopefully we, we don't get to realize the L and we must do all that we can to avoid the U and hope for the best and use our agency to really uh, work within the V, but get the upside of the V. Marius, thank you very much. As I said, once again, lovely talking to you. And I really look forward to inviting you back here on campus. As you can see, I'm sitting talking to you while I'm on campus. And um, it's, it's very eerie and quiet here, but it's also a pleasant place to be. So good luck and enjoy the rest of your day. And everybody else, enjoy your work. Keep South Africa going. Thanks, Marius. Thank Thanks, much. everybody.